Prevention of Sudden Death in Heart Failure. الدكتور حسام يقدم أول سبيكر إن شاء الله. مساء الخير على حضراتكم جميعا الحقيقة لما دخلت وشفت منظر قاعة حاجة تشرح القلب ولازم أهني أخويا العزيز الأستاذ الدكتور مجدي عبد الحميد على ميتنج هو النهاردة بقى من أهم الميتنجز بتاعة الهارت فيلير في مصر فبقى حاجة راسخة وحاجة ثابتة إحنا السيشن ده زي ما سمعنا من الدكتور إسلام إن هو على الصدن كارديك ديس في الهارت فيلير ده موضوع مهم جدا ويمكن احنا شفنا الدكتور مجدي مع الجروب بتاع الاوروبيان لو بابليكيشنز على السادن كارديك ديس فاحنا وانا برضو قبل ما اقدم السبيكرز عايز اقول ان انا سعيد ومتشرف بوجودي مع الاستاذ دكتور محمد اسام استاذ دكتور اسلام الفيرست سبيكر هيتكلم على الميكانيزمز اند ريسكس ريسك ايدنتيفيكيشن اوف سادن ديس ان هارت فيلير We have a professor. He is Luigi Tavares. From Sweden. Okay. Hope I I got your name right. Please, uh, Professor uh, Tavares. So thank you very much for the kind invitation. A fantastic meeting. Fantastic program. It's my pleasure to talk today uh, regarding mechanisms and risk uh, stratification for sudden cardiac death. I'm Gianluigi Savarese. I'm professor of cardiology and consultant for heart failure at Karolinska Institute and Karolinska University Hospital uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. And it's my pleasure to be board member of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology. This is the list of my conflict of interest since I will talk about drugs and devices. It's good to keep them in mind. So we talk about uh, sudden cardiac death. So first of all, what is sudden cardiac death? I think it's always important to remind the definition of that. And sudden cardiac death is defined as a non-traumatic, unexpected fatal event due to cardiac causes occurring within one hour from the onset of symptoms in an apparently healthy individual. Why do we talk about uh, sudden cardiac death in heart failure? We do that because this is a common uh, cause of death in our uh, in our patients with uh, with heart failure. Here you see in REF and PEF uh, the proportion the different proportions of causes of death, both underlying and immediate cause of death. And you see actually that sudden cardiac death and arrhythmic death has a, a relevant proportion in this population. And therefore, it's very important always to consider in our patients a preventive strategy for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. So in any case, nowadays, uh, we a little bit challenge the importance of using uh, defibrillators, so ICDs, for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. And one of the uh, reported reasons for that is that optimal medical therapies or pharmacological therapies actually lead to a reduction in risk of sudden cardiac death. And therefore, it might not be even more needed to use ICDs for prevention of sudden cardiac death. The question is, that true or not? So this is an important study that was published a few years ago. And uh, actually here, uh, they observed in many, many trials which have been published over the year, a reduction in risk of sudden cardiac death. And actually, they associated this to the development of pharmaco pharmacological therapies in, uh, in the heart failure fields. You can see the slope of this curve. You see it's going down. And in few words, in the studies, it was shown that there was a 44% decline in sudden cardiac death across the trials. And the, co the cumulative incidence of sudden death at 90 days after randomization was 2.4 in the earlier trials, but only 1% in the later trial, OK? So it seemed that the, uh, the importance of preventing sudden cardiac death is going down since pharmacological treatment might reduce death. But is that really true? So if we just try to interpret this uh, study a little bit more in detail, you see actually that the risk of sudden cardiac death in the treatment arm, so the white circle, in the scd have trials more than 20 years ago is exactly the same as in the paradigm HF trial. 
So probably the conclusion of this study is not that the risk of sudden cardiac death is so much decreasing over time and that pharmacological treatments reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. But important in clinical practice is to uh, try to uh, identify those patients who might experience sudden cardiac death, whether they have heart failure, and also very important, therefore, to understand the mechanisms underlying sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure. Fibrosis, which might be common in patients with heart failure, is a very important substrate for ventricular reentrant arrhythmias, and this might be linked with sudden cardiac death. And in this very simple but very important study which has been published a few years ago, it was shown that whether there was fibrosis, the risk of uh, having device therapies was much higher, as also the risk of dying was much higher. So, and this was the case for both ischemic and not ischemic cardiomyopathy. So fibrosis per se was an important trigger for arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. So therefore, fibrosis may be an important target for risk stratification. And we will talk a little bit about risk stratification in a few minutes. There are also other mechanisms underlying the increasing risk of VT in patients with, uh, uh, with heart failure. Nowadays, they are not uh, therapeutic targets, but important to keep that in mind because they might become so. So important mechanisms are also me mechanical stretch impacting the effective refractory period and the mean action potential duration. This mechanical stretch might be due to volume overload that is very common in patients with heart failure. The uh, increased inhomogeneous sympathetic activity that you can have in the myocardium because of fibrosis, for example, uh, ischemic area, so the, the tissue is not homogeneous, homogeneous in terms of sympathetic activity. High circulatory concentration of endothelin 1 and norepinephrine to, uh, due to the neurohormone activation and then also some other important uh, molecular changes that you can see here and might um, uh, create some abnormalities in the propagation of the electrical impulse. Um, it's also important to remember that also in patients with FPEF, there is for a certain degree risk of sudden cardiac death, but this has not really been explored in detail in current studies. But how do uh, we use ICDs today and, and how do we prevent sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? These are the current guidelines from the uh, HFA and the SC uh, provided in uh, 2021. You can see cl class uh, one recommendation level of ev evidence A for symptomatic heart failure near class two, three for only ischemic etiology. Uh, and an EF lower than 35, despite three months of optimal medical therapy, uh, provided that patients are expected to survive more than one year in good functional status. And in the new guidelines, uh, we have also this 2A recommendation for patients with non-ischemic etiology, whereas in the previous guidelines, we did just have 1A recommendation in general, regardless uh, regardless, the etiology of heart failure, so both ischemic and not ischemic heart failure. So you will see we have few criteria. We identify a quite broad uh, group of patients who might benefit of uh, this intervention, but probably uh, we are challenging the use of ICDs in this population because we don't see so much effect in terms of prevention to do the fact that we just see a diluted effect of the intervention, which might be due to the wrong identification of the target for, for the treatment. So who should receive an ICD? There should be patients with high risk of sudden cardiac death. They should have low risk of all-cause mortality, and therefore uh, the role of ICDs in these patients might be high. If we have a low, uh, high risk of all-cause mortality and at the same time uh, a, re a high risk of sudden cardiac death, for example, in a patient who has many, many, many comorbidities, as, I don't know, 
uh, very severe impaired uh, renal function, uh, a patient who is 85 years old, and so on. Uh, there might be very high risk of competing events, which means that it might be useless to implant an ICD because patients might die for something which is not sudden cardiac death, but a competing cause of death. So this shows you once again that for implanting ICDs in the right patients, you should identify the right populations. And how to do that? There are tools uh, which are available and they are supported by good studies, but we do not use them in clinical practice. Some very important scores, for example, the Seattle proportional risk model, uh, where just by using few variables, it's possible to predict the risk of sudden cardiac death. As I said in the previous slide, whether this is high, there, there might be important to impl implant an ICD in that kind of patient. And there is also a model to try to predict risk of all cause of death. And as I said, we want that this should be low in, uh, in patients receiving, in, uh, receiving an ICD. And here you see that with few variables, we might be able to predict in a quite mm, trustable way risk of all cause mortality in one year, two year, and five year. This is the Seattle heart failure model. So we do know at the moment that uh, ICDs uh, prevent sudden cardiac death and reduce all cause mortality by doing so in, in large populations. This is a contemporary study we did um, run in the Swedish Heart Failure Registry, still observational study. We could see that using an ICD was associated with a very low but still statistically significant reduction in risk of sudden of all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality and the reduction was 12 percent so here in a contemporary court uh, there was still uh, highlighted importance of this intervention but if we look at this slide this is again from the swedish heart failure registry in a study we conducted uh, quite recently in the forest plot you can clearly see that in patients with low mortality at high sudden cardiac death, the, 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 the association between using of ICDs and uh, mortality was uh, on the left side of the forest plot and therefore ICDs were, were reducing risk of all cause mortality in this subgroup of patients, so low, low mortality and high sudden cardiac death risk but not in the other subgroups. Low mortality, low sucker cardiac death, high mortality, low risk of sudden cardiac death, high mortality, and high risk of sudden cardiac death. And we derived these four categories by using the Seattle heart failure model and the Seattle uh, proportional risk model. So if we identify uh, the right population for ICDs, we may also see a very strong association between using the ICD and the outcome. Here, the other ratio was around 0.6 in the group with low mortal, low predicted mortality and high predicted sudden cardiac risk. Very important not to forget that beyond this risk course nowadays, um, we might also uh, try to understand a little bit more what's going on in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy after the Danish trial, and I'm sure you will talk about Danish trial later, that's why I'm not mentioning that. In this very interesting study, it was observed that by creating a score using this few variable, so ejection fraction uh, and uh, sex and volumes at the uh, MRI and LGA, it was actually possible to stratify population and identify those who were at higher risk of arrhythmic events. So even in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, if, we, if you find the right patient, ICD might be effective. And that's why probably the NANISH trial has been neutral as well. So if you take home messages, sudden cardiac death still exists. So it, it's not completely true that pharmacological treatments ha have decreased so much this risk that we don't need devices anymore. So do we need ICDs? Yes, but we need to target the right population. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savars. Uh, 
Um, I have a question about primary prevention, as you mentioned, uh, because we aren't a rich country uh, just like Sweden. Um, have we implanted uh, ICD for a non ischemic patient with heart failure? And we have alternative medical treatment, and this financial uh, burden will be high in a country just like Egypt. What is your opinion in this uh, situation? So I just think that a pharmacological treatment is not an alternative. So you are actually not comparing pharmacological treatment to device therapy, and you can say, well, pharmacological t treatments are improving, reducing so much the risk of sudden cardiac death that we might not need any more ICDs. I think there is still room for using ICDs. And I think also nowadays the cost of devices has decreased a lot. So I think it's also uh, more uh, the case of talking about uh, implanting this device, of course, in the right patients. I also think that whether you stratify the, in the right way the population for the risk of sudden cardiac death, you might prevent useless implantations in patients who will never need an ICD. So risk stratification is actually the key for cost effectiveness of ICDs. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, you focused on um, uh, mechanisms and risk stratification, yet it was clear from your presentation that uh, the need for ICDs is uh, decreasing and pharmacologic treatment is, um, is clearly uh, decreasing sudden cardiac death, and you showed this, and you showed the evidence. And now in uh, our practice, in our daily practice, we are sometimes faced with a patient in whom he might fit the criteria of having an ICD, but still we, we are not sure whether uh, the results of the trials, uh, the LAC paradigm and the, the new heart failure trials would justify us to still so how can we solve, the, uh, solve this paradox? Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't talk about all the studies from the pharmacological trials because I think there will be a talk later on that. Uh, honestly, I don't think those studies are so much powered for, uh, and they are not even designed to assess so much in detail that specific research question. That's a, a first point. And, uh, uh, second point, the interpretation of that analysis where it seems that the risk is decreasing over time was also showing at the same time that the risk of sudden cardiac death of those receiving sacubitri valsartan in the paradigm trial was exactly the same in a patient uh, as compared with a patient uh, enrolled in the SADF trial 20 years ago. So actually, I think the evidence supporting uh, not using ICDs uh, due to the fact the pharmacological treatment reduced the risk of sudden cardiac death is not that strong, honestly. Okay, the last question, Dr. Hani. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Just talking about fibrosis you mentioned, yeah. actually, as you know, there is a new paper talking about the um, new biomarker about collagen degradation products. So do you think that this new biomarker, we can use it sooner, like a BMP, to categorize high-risk patient with a lot of fibrosis with this new biomarker of collagen degradation? That's an excellent question, and, and thank you for that, because it, it really helps me to, to highlight how important, I think, is the assessment of fibrosis in patients with heart failure for deciding uh, the implantation of ICDs. I think we should move in that direction and try to pursue this precision medicine. We all talk about that, but nobody does it. So try to identify the right patient might be the one with fibrosis and whether performing an MRI in all patients with heart failure might be too much expensive. Some surrogates like biomarkers might be definitely the key. And there are studies on BMP, if I'm not wrong, and some others uh, targeting in specific fibrosis, like the collagen degradation, which is which makes definitely sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Savarese. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for sharing the, the meeting and news in your Twitter page. Thank you very much. The next talk on prevention of sudden 
death and heart failure medical treatment professor dr giuseppe rosano from uk uh, professor rosano is a professor of uh, cardiology at uh, st george's university of london and he is the uh, president of the heart failure association of the ec he will join us in the opening uh, ceremony uh, live now it's a recorded presentation so go ahead for Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, albeit uh, on uh, line, uh, to discuss the medical therapy for the prevention, prevention of sudden death in heart failure. We know that uh, uh, um, sudden death is a common event in uh, patients with heart failure, and that is not limited only to patients with uh, class 4. You can see where paradoxically it's even lower than in patients with uh, New York Heart Association class uh, 2 and 3 and uh, uh, so it's um, uh, a pre preventing sudden death especially in patients with uh, chronic heart failure with uh, in class uh, 2 and 3 is very important because it will uh, reduce overall mortality in uh, heart failure uh, when we discuss the, about the uh, risk stratification for sudden cardiac death, there are major issues to be considered. First of all, that the me mechanisms of sudden death may differ differ according to the different uh, substrate of heart failure. Then, uh, this for the same in same patients, multiple mechanisms may uh, coexist. And uh, uh, for some uh, forms of heart failure, especially for the post ischemic ones, there, are, there is a time uh, dependent evolution of the mechanisms because they can be related to the acute coronary syndrome, the post acute coronary syndromes, or when there is a scar tissue that has developed into heart failure. And uh, regarding the risk classification, however, there are no tests that perform well in patients with uh, very low ejection fraction. And uh, uh, it is important to pay attention to those patients with 11 ventricular function around 35% or 35 to 40. One uh, clear evidence is that uh, the degree of um, uh, sympathetic innervation of the heart is uh, associated with an increased risk of, heart, uh, of a sudden cardiac death. And we can use the uh, MIPG uh, uh, SPECT assessment in order to look at the innervation of the heart. You can see that there are differences between uh, the ratio and the uptake between uh, the heart and the upper mediastinum that is called the HM ratio. You can uh, and you can see here that where there is a upper innervation that is uh, uh, 2.2 in terms of uh, um, a normal innervation that increases to 1.1 decreases to 1.1 in New York Association class and this is uh, clearly associated with uh, uh, arrhythmic events because those patients with uh, a uh, um, uh, uh, high uh, um, lower um, uh, heart to mediastinum rate of Mikberg have a uh, significantly worse prognosis, a significantly greater um, occurrence of antiarrhythmic arrhythmic event and sudden uh, death. When we look also at the um, patient, uh, at the innervation, it's also important in the patients with uh, ICD because in patients with ICD, the increased uh, uh, sympathetic innervation of the heart is associated with uh, an uh, increased uh, uh, discharge in appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, uh, ICD discharge. So it, uh, there's no doubt that an increased sympathetic drive is associated, increased sympathetic activity is associated with uh, an increased uh, risk of uh, um, sudden cardiac death. Uh, in those patients with um, uh, ischemic heart failure, there are scar-related uh, um, uh, reasons for the uh, sudden death, and so the anatomic barriers, the conduct functional conduction abnormality, then heterogeneity of conduction with uh, dispersion of the um, electrical 
um, conduction and uh, uh, on which the increase in pathetic tone may play an important role. And you can clearly see, clearly see here the difference between an healthy tissue where there is a normal propagation of the um, uh, electric impulse and uh, uh, co compared to a fibrotic one. And uh, uh, therefore the vent um, ventricular tachycardia or the um, uh, ventricular, uh, ventricular fibrillation related to scar can be uh, related to slow conduction slowing on one side or conduction block that may favor a re-entry mechanisms. So the causes of the sudden cardiac death in heart failure may be related to different substrates, to triggers that may, for example, in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation where an increased sympathetic drive may induce the uh, um, fatal arrhythmias, the autonomic uh, nervous systems and the coexistence of uh, ischemia. There is evidence that the um, uh, uh, therapies that we use for the treatment of heart failure associated with a reduced mortality. These are the data with Enalapril in the consensus trial where they, uh, there was a parallel reduction of um, a sudden cardiac death compared to the effect on the overall mort mortality for heart failure. But it was clear from the ACE inhibitor studies that uh, uh, there were patients with uh, um, heart failure compared to those in the, pre to the prevention trials at a significantly higher uh, sympathetic activity demonstrated by median plasma norepinephrine, increased renin activity, and uh, uh, increased uh, natriuretic peptides. And uh, it became clear that the increased blood plasma norepinephrine was associated with an increased uh, uh, mortality, and this was mostly an uh, 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 sudden cardiac death or pump failure. So uh, the beta blockers then came into play, and they clearly demonstrated a dr drastic reduction in uh, the mortality from heart failure with a 44% uh, reduction in mortality for sudden death that was even greater than the overall mortality for, or the overall total, total mortality for heart failure was independent from the dose uh, of metoprolol used uh, in the Merit HF study. So the beta blockers also are eff effective in patients with implantable devices because they have a reduced heart heart rate and uh, increase the CRTD um, capture. The, um, uh, in patients with ICD, they will uh, uh, reduce the adequate and inadequate shocks and therefore beta blockers have a very central role for the prevention of uh, um, sudden cardiac death in patients with uh, heart failure. Similarly, the um, uh, epleronone and uh, the MRAs have clearly demonstrated a reduction in uh, the uh, mortality for sudden cardiac death. You can see the 21% reduction in the mortality from sudden cardiac death in the Ephesus uh, uh, trial. More recently, uh, we know that sacubitril valsartan reduced by 20% the occurrence of um, um, uh, a sudden cardiac death, and this was similar to the reduction in mortality per uh, all causes. But what we can, we can observe over the years is that the, the mortality for sudden death has decreased, and therefore that uh, the, the more we use the um, foundation therapy, the more re we reduce the occurrence of uh, sudden cardiac death. And uh, we have also evidence of a similar 21% reduction of, uh, of uh, sudden cardiac death with uh, DAPA glyphos in, in the DAPA HF study. So basically, we have a clear evidence from the four foundation therapies that they are very effective in reducing the mortality from heart failure. So Although sudden cardiac death is frequent in patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction and is due to different pathophysiological mechanisms, we know that the neurohormonal activation is associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death, but all the foundation therapies for HFREF reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death and therefore should be implemented at any encounter in patients with heart failure because of their significant benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we are coming to the last speaker in our uh, session, uh, Professor Dr. Lamia Allam, Professor of Cardiology and Shams University.
دكتورة لاميا is one of the distinguished and skilled electrophysiologist. دكتورة لاميا will speak about the current indication of indications of the ICD. I have one question, Dr. Alamia, for primary prevention. How much patient or how many patients need, do you think, needs uh, ICD uh, in Egypt now? Uh, I will answer uh, uh, this question uh, in my presentation, so I will keep my, my answer at, at the end, okay? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here in uh, Heart Failure Congress. So thank you, Dr. Magdi, and all the organizing committee for inviting me today. And uh, I want to thank Professor Seravova because he made my lecture easier to be presented by his excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I will talk about the current indications of ICD in patients with heart failure. As uh, my uh, previous presentation uh, said that sudden, uh, through all those advances in the ma medical management of patients with heart failure, still mortality and morbidity remains uh, quietly higher than should be all through these advances. And over more than three decades, there were efforts to uh, decrease or reduce the overall mortality, all cause mortality and sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure using medical treatment. But uh, all these trials showed that unfortunately the antiarrhythmic medications may worsen the survival and even amiodarone, although it is safer, but it shows only slight improvement uh, in the outcome and didn't reduce the sudden cardiac death as we wish. That's why there were the innovations in the ICDs and the different technologies uh, done in the ICDs, uh, different algorithms we, don't, we used to make the uh, more algorithm to uh, decrease the inappropriate and the appropriate shock by improve the algorithm for discrimination between ventricular arrhythmias and the other non-ventricular arrhythmias and not depend on ICD just for defibrillator but also cardioverter by using uh, other way for management like pacing, anti-tachycardia pacing, makes the batteries smaller and even the batteries has a longer uh, life to decrease the numbers of replacement of the battery. And actually ICD indeed it was proved that it is effective in reduction of uh, sudden cardiac death in patients with proven ventricular arrhythmias for secondary prevention, in, especially in patients with low ejection fraction. All the trials all through the past years and even the meta-analysis of these important trials shows that ICD for secondary prevention, it reduced about 27 or 28% reduction in all-cause mortality in patients with half rap and even due to reduction about 50% in arrhythmic deaths. That's why even, even uh, it's prolonged life, about five months over follow-up six years for these patients. That's why it's still from the previous guidelines and the recent guidelines published by ACC uh, two months ago, ICD is a class one indication for secondary prevention, either for ischemic patients with hemodynamically unstable angina, documented ventricular fibrillation, and even if the patient has ejection fraction more for 40%, if uh, he, the ICD is a class 2A indication for this patient, especially if the VT ablation not reached or uh, achieved the established point in the patient with ischemia or unavailable or undesirable by the patient. But in the dilated cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, still the patient with documented uh, hemodynamically unstable uh, ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular fibrillation is a class one aid to implant ICDs. And even if they show a hemodynamically uh, uh, sustained monomorphic VT, it is a class two A because the VT ablation, it's not, can, it can't achieve the established point to end these arrhythmias rather than the ischemic because of the low, uh, the higher recurrence rate and low, lower success rate. What about the ICD for primary prevention? ICD was proved to be effective in uh, primary prevention to prevent incidence of sudden cardiac death or reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death in patient who has risks for sudden, uh, for sudden cardiac death but actually didn't have any documented arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias. 
And all through these uh, important trials like MADIT, Companions, CAD Heft, shows that the ICD, like CAD Heft, which included ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopsis with ejection fraction less than 35%, the ICD reduced the uh, sudden cardio, the all over mortality by uh, 23%. Uh, and the meta-analysis of the, the five important uh, trial for primary prevention of ICD in ischemic and non-ischemic even included the companion, which included patients had actually inserted uh, a CRT and to compare between the CRTB and CRT with defibrillator shows as about 31 reduction of all cause mortality with ICD relative to the only medical therapy. That's why in the previous guidelines, ECC, in 2015, it was a class one indication for any patient with symptomatic heart failure, less than 35% ejection fraction, and on optimal medical treatment for at least three months, for non-ischemic and ischemic cardiomyopathy, it is class one indication. But actually, today, the survival rate are better than in the previous ICD trial. And as we see, up to the Danish trial, there is increase in the survival, uh, even in patients without ICDs, due to improved medical therapy, innovations in the drugs, early revascularization and intervention, the lower arrhythmic risk, and more CRT implantations. So one of the important trials, which it was the Danish trial. Danish trial uh, studied patients with uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and has a class one indication according to the ACC guidelines for ICD. And they randomly studied this patient and even the most important in this, in this trial, they included patients with CRT. And about 85% of these patients has CRT implanted. And we found that there is no reduction in all cause mortality significant in patients with ICD versus the medical treatment. But there is a significant, despite the significant reduction in the sudden cardiac death and the cardiovascular deaths. And when they analyzed the subgroups and the comorbidities in this patient, they found that the only factor that decreased the, effective, effective, uh, the efficacy of uh, the ICD is the elderly patient. If the patient has more than 70 uh, uh, years, uh, the uh, efficacy of the ICD reduced as a primary prevention. But there is another big study done in Europe, which is the EU third ICD, uh, it included 15 countries. They studied actually randomly the patients with ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, through five years and uh, has as IC ICDs versus non-ICD. And they found that although the trials or the results of Danish trial, still the ICD is very effective to decrease the all-cause mortality in these patients up to 27% reduction. And even it is more in decrease the, in reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. But when also analyzed the comorbidities, they found that the ICD is less effective for the elderly and the patient with diabetes. That's why in the recent guidelines, there is uh, a recommendation, although it is a class 2B, but it said that in the elderly patient in whom a benefit from defibrillator is not expected due to patient's age and comorbidities, omission of ICD may be considered. And in the previous, in the last uh, current guidelines, this is a, a very nice algorithm for how to, or how to choose patients to, for implantation of ICD for primary prevention. Although the coronary artery disease is still proven that ICD for primary prevention is a class one indication, especially in patients with ejection fraction less than 35%. The, the same recommendation from the previous guidelines. But they added that, we said is that you should implant ICD for a low ejection fraction if the patient has NEHA class two or three. But if the patient in class NEHA class one, but the ejection fraction is less than 30%, you should implant the ICD as a class two A. But if the patient has a mildly reduced ejection fraction between 36 and 40%, and the patient has non-sustained VT or unexplained syncope, you should do an EB study, and if you have an inducible sustained monomorphic VT, the uh, ICD is uh, indicated as a class 2A. What about the dilated cardiomyopathy? The situation changes a little. The ICD become a class 2A 
from a class one in the previous guidelines five years ago for implanting ICD as a primary prevention in patients with asymptomatic heart failure with NEHA class two or three. And they put a, a nice algorithm to refine the indications of ICD as a primary prevention in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. First, you should identify the cause of dilated cardiomyopathy using a CMR or cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and found if there is specific etiologies for dilated cardiomyopathy like sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, and give a specific therapy or myocarditis. If the patient has no specific etiology, it should uh, search for the familial uh, cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is present. If the patient has a family history of sudden cardiac death or AV or AV conduction or block in age in young age, less than 50 years. In this situation, if yes or no, you should do a genetic testing as a class 1A in this situation, as a class 2A in the other situations. If the do a search for uh, malignant uh, genetics that like lemon cardiomyopathy. Lemon cardiomyopathy is a genetic arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy which is characterized by conductive disturbances and the uh, malignant arrhythmias. That's why if you have a proven that the patient has a, mutata, a mutation, lamina mutation, it is a class uh, 2A indication to implant ICD if the patient has impaired ejection fraction less than 50% and uh, AV co or AV conduction delay and uh, five-year risk of ventricular arrhythmias more than 10%. But if you didn't find this genetic mutation, you should assess the, now the ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction become not the only uh, indication for primary BCR, uh, primary, uh, uh, prevent, uh, primary prevention for dilated cardiomyopathy. If the patient has ejection fraction less than 35, it's now a class 2A rather than class 1. And if the patient has 36 to 50%, you should search for the risk factors of sudden cardiac death. What is the risk factors? Uh, the presence of fibrosis in uh, uh, late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac uh, MRI, presence of other mutations which uh, increase the risk of sudden cardiac death, and uh, presence of syncope or conduction delay. If these risks more than two risks, you should implant ICD as a class 2A. If not, see if the patient is symptomatic or not symptomatic. If the patient uh, has an explained syncope, you should do an EB study. If it has an ventricular arrhythmia, implant the ICD as a class 2A. This is the risk factors for uh, uh, occurrence or higher risk of sudden cardiac death. My recommendation, or take my home, take home message, current guidelines supporting ICD implantation for primary and secondary prevention up till now, and shows the effectiveness of ICD to reduce all cause mortality and sudden cardiac death. But in the current guidelines, there is further narrowing criteria to reduce an un unnecessary ICD implantations and the undefiled high-risk patients, especially in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Thank you. For Alamia, a very nice uh, presentation where you touched on the, all the important uh, points. I think you asked it. Yes, I think it's a good thing. Dr. Magdi, we're very happy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Damia. Excellent presentation, as usual. Thank you. Uh, we have seen three important uh, presentations, uh, started by uh, Professor Janlouji Sabari. So he described the mechanism of sudden death and then the role of uh, medical therapy with uh, Professor Rosano. And you uh, discussed the in details, the indications of ICD. And we have seen a lot of different algorithms, which might. Uh, yes to the confusion, uh, which patients who should be subjected to ICD. So in short, to summarize, mm -hmm. sudden death is common in heart failure patients, 50%, mostly due to ventricular arrhythmia. Yes. Number two, the debate in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, when to implant an ICD. With the use of the disease-modifying agents, the four pillars now, which has a favorable effect on reverse LV remodeling and decrease the incidence of serious ventricular arrhythmias. So according to this, there is down grading in the new guidelines for ICD as a primary prevention in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy to class 2A, as you mentioned. But consider important uh, indications to consider ICD in patients who are at high risk due to genetic genetic risk, yes. such as patients at risk for 
familiar dialectic can remember the risk of poor sudden Number two, the NIHA function class in patients with functional class, NIHA, NIHA class four, mortality is due to bomb failure, not yes. due to sudden death. That's why it's out from the implications. Yes. The age above 70 and comorbidities. Yes. And the, finally, the role of CMR for the presence of scar and myocardial fibrosis, which are considered as indications to support the role of ICD in non ischemic cardiomyopathy. Yeah, that's this right. right yes, this, I agree with you uh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this will end this session. We can move to the next session. Thank you very much.